Hello, my name is John Lovett, uh, and I'm the Chair of Global Challenges at the University of Leeds. And here I am in the, in the university campus at Leeds, while COP27 in Egypt is entering its second week. Uh, we're going to bring together a, a, a panel today from uh, Indonesia, India and Uganda, and we're going to talk about microgrids. Okay, the, the, the fight against human created climate change has stimulated creation of many new environmentally sound technologies. It's now possible to supply electricity from locally generated renewable sources at an affordable price. Now, these microgrids are transforming people's lives and facilitating achievement of sustainable development goals. Microgrids are the next big thing. The panel will discuss the social, economic and environmental impact of microgrids. So if we could just quickly go around the, uh, the panel, if you could introduce yourselves and just say where you're from. Anissa. Hello, thank you, Professor Lovett. Uh, my name is Anissa Joviani Astari. I'm from Geography Department, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, so what? Hello, everyone. I'm Saud Sagala from Indonesia, Bandung Institute Technology, School of uh, Planning and Architecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth. I'm senior researcher from RDI, Resilience Development Initiative. Thank you. And Soraya? Hello, everyone. I'm Shreya Ghosh. Department of Lifestyle Learning and uh, Extension. I'm a research scholar here and we are from India. Thank you. Thank you. Prof. Amit. Uh, I am uh, Amit Hajra, a professor in the Department of uh, Rural Management and Rural Extension Center from Vishwa Bharati, India. Thank you very much. Mary Susan. Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Susan Abo. Uh, from the Center for Research in Energy and Energy Conservation at Makere University in Uganda. Thank you, Mary Susan. And Flavia. Hello, everyone. Ajambo Flavia. I am the Communication Specialist for Center for Research in Energy and Energy Conservation in Makere University, Uganda. Thank you very much, Flavia. And in the background, we have the, the team from the Digital Education Service at Leeds who will be helping us by playing videos. So, Jono, can you play video one? The welcome video, please. What this course will do initially is to focus on Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is about providing universal access to affordable, clean energy. The course covers two weeks. In the first week, we're going to be talking about general aspects of microgrids and Sustainable Development Goal 7. And how Sustainable Development Goal 7, for example, how it relates to the, the other Sustainable Development Goals and how important energy is for providing the basics for sustainable development. You will also explore the different approaches to electrification and off-grid technologies. You will be introduced to the microgrid design tool PIE Plan which is computer software developed by a team at the University of Leeds. In the second week, we're going to get a little bit more technical. We'll review a few case studies of microgrids in different countries and practice using the PIE plan tool. Great, thank you very much, John Ope. So that clip was from our new massive open online course of microgrids, which is on the FutureLearn platform and which launched this week. And in the course, we talk about some of the, uh, the practical implementation that's been done by Creek in Uganda, uh, where they've been implementing uh, microgrids. So uh, Mary, Susan and Flavia, you've, you've been using PIE plan to design a microgrid. Could you tell us a little bit about Creek and tell us what a microgrid is, please? Thank you, Professor John. Um, we have been using Pi e plan for planning our mini grid projects in Uganda. And Pi e plan is uh, 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 a planning uh, tool that was designed out of a research collaboration uh, with the University of Leeds on resilient mini grids. 
Uh, it's a tool that helps to uh, optimize investment. Uh, it's able to pick up uh, historical data and uh, also uh, optimize uh, aspects on the technical parameters uh, that has been a challenge in our microgrid planning in Uganda. So this tool is web-based and it's actually open source. So uh, we're now making it available also and publicizing it for usage for the government. Now, Creek is a center for research in energy and energy uh, conservation here in uh, Makere University, Uganda. And it was established 20 years ago uh, to enhance access to modern types of energy, uh, looking at uh, cooking energy, but also energy for other aspects, electricity supply for lighting, uh, electricity supply for communities and uh, supply for productive uses to drive development in the country. And as a country, we have a, a 10 year plan to install over 600 microgrids, having seen the potential. So this tool, a uh, PI -E plan is going to help us a lot in uh, optimizing planning in order to achieve the, the, the goals of the National Development Plan on energy access here in Uganda. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Susan Flavia. One of the things that you've been doing at Creek is raising uh, awareness of uh, people with renewable energy technologies. Can you can you tell us a little bit about how you've been raising awareness, please? Thank you very much. Uh, so we at Creek have been a little bit diverse with our approach to raising awareness, and with our project that we did under the African Clean Energy Research Alliance, we were able to work around using movies, uh, using radio, radio drama series, TV series, just to really communicate the impact of renewable energy technologies and to even demonstrate how people can be able to utilize them in their day-to-day -day lives. So mixing a little bit of entertainment, uh, humor and satire, we feel like the message is going to really stick with people and we hope to really make an impact with how people consume information and maybe influence more and more people to take up uh, different diverse ways to disseminate information. Thank you very much, Flavio. And of course, one of the ways that we've been uh, disseminating information is using this massive open online course. Uh, and uh, I see we have quite a few people from, from Africa and Uganda have signed up to the course at the moment uh, and going through it. So, Jono, can you show us clip two from the course, uh, who owns the winds? We are surrounded by renewable energy in the form of light and heat from the sun, wind, river flow and biomass from the growth of plants. In the sea, waves and tides, and in the ground, geothermal energy. The sun, the wind, the waves and the tides are not owned by anyone. The cost of capturing their energy lies in the cost of the technology needed, the place where the technology will be on site, and the transmission network and operation and maintenance. Not every source of renewable energy comes free of charge. River flow is often owned by whoever has rights to the river. Biomass costs money to grow, and geothermal energy is extracted under terms of mineral rights. These many different sources of renewable energy not only provide alternatives to fossil fuels, they also provide cost-effective ways of generating electricity depending on local conditions. Thank you very much, Jono. Prof Amit and Sarea, could you tell us about the work that uh, VBU in India has been doing on renewable energy? and the efforts that India has been making to switch to renewable energy sources. And do you think renewable energy is being used to power microgrids in, in India, uh, especially by local communities? Uh, well, John, uh, India has uh, achieved a marvelous position in the world scenario as uh, is the third largest producer of uh, renewable energy. Uh, with 40% of its uh, installed electricity capacity coming from non-fuel uh, sources. Now, um, 
this uh, renewable energy uh, uh, from solar power from wind power from biomass and small hydropower etc uh, and the solar power stood first and the, followed by wind power and biomass energy still biomass energy we are lacking behind it's only 10 giga high uh, gigawatt and uh, in, in from solar energy we will get uh, we are actually getting 60 uh, or uh, gigawatt uh, which is 66 percent achievement and from wind power also we are getting uh, more than 50 gigawatt which is 88 percent achievement and India has set a target to reduce the carbon intensity uh, of the na nation's economy uh, as 45% by uh, 2030 and net zero by 2070. And uh, uh, so the low carbon technology or carbon footprint technology uh, will create a $80 billion market in India and uh, indian uh, union government has also uh, additionally allocated 19500 crore for solar uh, scheme and uh, 5 to 7 percent biomass pellets to be co-fired uh, in thermal power plants that also decided in the union ministry and most interestingly uh, our prime minister launched a very important mass movement that is for life that is lifestyle for environment. So we hope that we will achieve uh, our targets uh, by 50% reducing carbon footprint by 2030. Now, if we talk about... Sorry, sorry, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So if we talk about Vishwabharati, so from Vishwabharati also, we are conducting many uh, collaborative projects which are uh, enhancing rural sources, rural energy sources in the local communities. For example, if we take Befong, it was a project with University of Leeds and Creek Uganda and various Indian partners where we provided biogas and bioenergy to the local communities where they have successfully switched to the renewable energy by keeping aside the traditional cooking fuel and also have uh, like subsidized to almost uh, 15 to 20 percent of the chemical fertilizers and now they are uh, promoting sustainable agriculture there are various other projects also like some gst funded projects like mission innovation india where they have provided uh, micro grids uh, in the uh, in one of the interior village of manipur that's in northeast of india where uh, the communities are receiving electricity at present and also there are other projects also uh, like a community water project where we are providing clean drinking water and cooking water to a school of uh, almost 2000 students and uh, a locality of around 100 population uh, where they are getting pure drinking water through rainwater harvesting and solar water purifiers. So these are some of the initiatives taken by Vishwa Bharati in the rural communities in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saraya. Uh, in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, technology transfer is is quite uh, a, an important part. I mean, people tend to talk a lot about greenhouse gas emissions by the uh, historically industrialized countries, but a, a big part of having uh, economic development uh, with, without greenhouse gas emissions uh, is is embedded in the uh, in the transfer of uh, environmentally sound technologies. So uh, having things like the microgrid design tools for establishment of microgrids is quite important for that. So Jono, um, could you show us the uh, the next clip, which is about communities uh, and microgrids? and uh, the way that the, the, the technology of microgrids is being transfer transferred into communities and, and the kind of barriers and problems that uh, might be experienced during that technology transfer process. I found that uh, there are differences in how to perceive the electricity. Cheng uh, said that uh, the communities really want the electricity to be there. But the problem is how they utilize the electricity. It's not match with what is currently expected by the providers. 
for example, um, some of the NGOs, some of the government, they expect that the electricity can in increase the economic activities of the village so that they can be more income uh, for the household. But uh, my finding found that the, the community perceived it uh, as a direct benefit. I mean, it's just for the lighting, it's just for the use of some several appliances. And most of them are using the electricity for entertainment. This make a problem because the microgrids have to be managed by themselves. So they have to generate a profit in order to pay for the operation and the maintenance. So that's, that's quite a problem there. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. And in that video, it happens to be talking about his research on Sumba Island, uh, in which the communities are, are not quite ready yet to pay for the cost of the establishment of microgrids. Uh, Elizabeth and, and Howard, could you tell us about the work that RDI has been doing on some island in Indonesia and the efforts that Indonesia has been doing to enable the transition to renewable energy and microgrids? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, I'll start to give a overview and then Elizabeth will, will come uh, more details on, on what RDI has been uh, working on in Samba. So basically, uh, on Indonesia national energy policy, it meant that's the target to to mix the energy renewable energy in the primary energy mix about 20% in 2025, and to minimize also the use of petroleum to less than 25% uh, in that year, and that's stated in the nationally determined contribution, uh, and particularly in uh, electrification ratio, aiming to uh, have 100% uh you know around 2021 although there are some challenges like some provinces that remain under uh that number especially like uh, what happened in east nusa tenggara ntt where sumba island uh, also part of it the electrification ratio in that province is around 88 percent in 2021 and for this reason government of indonesia has voiced its support for renewable energy based development in rural villages and in the context of microgrid development in Indonesia and in Sumba, for example, there are several programs to increase its electrification ratio. That includes the Sumba Iconic Island. Uh, you, you have been there as well, and also some other, I think, colleagues here, and also initiated by the government of Indonesia together with uh, international partners, including uh, HIFOS from the Netherlands, trying to achieve that uh, renewable energy access for poor people living in the remote area. The keyword that you mentioned on, on, on community is very important here, how to develop the energy potential in the village community. And there are several things to consider, but in a nutshell, a careful assessment of the community renewable energy potential and its access to external energy supply is needed. And not only that, a proper assessment of the potential that community has will also provide guidance on deciding which technology. I think the previous case in, in, in Africa was also mentioning about it and uh, how to select the most feasible to be transferred to community. And this can be done by assessing where in the energy ladder, you know, the community is, is located and to involve them in the uh, participatory uh, process, as well as financial concern and community willingness to pay. Let me stop here. And I think uh, I will uh, turn this to Elizabeth to continue explaining more about, about Sumba. Thank you. Thank you, Pa, pa Saud. So yeah, uh, about about the comment earlier on the video is very interesting, John, but I have to uh, disagree a little bit because, you know, talking about just transition, I think everyone needs the same rights to enjoy themselves and have a uh, entertaining life and a relax uh, with, with the space supply of energy, equal access to energy. So who knows that after they enjoy the energy that they come to um, thinking about how to have a profitable activity or profitable business, it might come. And that's why I, what I really like about the PIE plan is that um, 
we we do a lot of uh, questionnaire uh, collection uh, of information of what the community uh, would like for their electricity in Sumba Island. So we go around to 400 household in the community and asking about their willingness to pay and asking in more detail about uh, what quality of energy that they expect. So it's not just a top-down approach, but it's really a bottom-up approach. That would be all, John. Thank you. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Poo Elizabeth. We're getting some uh, really interesting questions coming in from the participants. Uh, there's one from Yazir who asks, can microgrids be used in a city? And he says that I think because the blackout in the city could be worse than the rural area, so city must have an al another alternative uh, energy power. Uh, that's an excellent question. And I, I think one of the things is about microgrids is that they can be very flexible. So you can have standalone microgrids in rural areas that are essentially little islands of electricity generation and transmission. And then you can have microgrids that are connected to the grid. And you can have those in areas uh, such as within a city where you get peer-to-peer -peer transmission of uh, uh, electricity between uh, different members of the microgrid within the community. But that's something we can perhaps come back to later in the uh, in the panel discussion. Uh, next, I'll ask uh, Anissa what she thinks about global agreements. Uh, OK, COP27 is taking place uh, at the moment in Egypt. But Elizabeth mentioned the just energy transition. What's your feeling for uh, a country like Indonesia? Do you, do you think these global agreements are dominated by certain particular interests there's been some discussion in cop 27 how there are very large numbers of lobbying groups from the fossil fuel industry there uh, what do you what do you think uh, anise uh, about the sovereign rights of countries to enable themselves to go and go through this just energy transition yeah okay uh, thank you john so yes indeed yeah uh, indonesia is always uh, responded to various global agreement as we know there there are sdgs like we know the cop 27 and uh yeah uh indonesia always embedded into the indonesian policy and some global agreements always being ratified also in the indonesian law as well but yeah, as we know, the extraterritorial territorial governments like this global agreement raised the metaphor of a hollow out state in which a state control actually uh, has been decreased. But yeah, uh, based on my research, however, in Indonesia, although the government's capacity is become restricted at some point, but uh, because of the rise of this transnational governance, but in fact that the whole out state and the decline or, or the decrease of the state power has not occurred. And yeah, instead, it, the government is enhancing its uh, institutional capacity through various policy, including the SDGs and the policy related to the renewable energy as well, like uh, microgrid now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anissa. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's really fascinating the way that these international negotiations play out and, uh, and the role that each of the different uh, countries are playing uh, and, the, and the power relations uh, between the different countries within the, uh, within the negotiations. Um, one, of, one of the things uh, about uh, the, 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 the role of uh, technology transfer and uh, building partnerships is building uh, capacity. So, John, can we have a look uh, at the next clip, uh, which comes from uh, the project where we had collaboratively between the uh, the, 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 the different uh, countries that you can see here represented by the partnership on the panel. And uh, Agnes is going to demonstrate to us uh, how PAI plan works. PAI e plan can be accessed from pieplan.sps-lab.org. So, here we have an introduction to the software, the different functionalities of the software, 
which includes the different modules where we have the data processing modules, the feeder routing module, the investment planning module, and the operational planning module. And in the website, you also find a guide to the installation of PyEplan if you want to install it on your own computer. You should be aware that PyEplan can as well be used with platforms such as Google Colab or Kaggle. So we'll provide you with a guideline on the installation and the different packages you'll need in case you're installing it on your computer. As well, we'll provide you a guideline on the input data that you need to input and how exactly you need to input it. Also, you have the output data as well and how you able to read the different output of your results. Thank you very much, Jono. So in the video, we saw Agnes talking about microgrid, the microgrid design tool, PyEplan. And Agnes is an, an electrical engineer from Uganda, and she's an expert in using the technology. Um, but it's the capacity to receive technologies uh, a limiting factor. Flavio, what's, what's your view from Uganda? Do, is, is capacity a, uh, an issue there to have the expertise to uh, implement these 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 new technologies. I think that I think the capacity is there. There is so much potential with what we can do. However, it's just the awareness of the resources available, the softwares available that people can use to size better systems or to even optimize their systems and plan much better. So if we can do the best we can in terms of awareness and spread the word, I think there are very many people who would want to take advantage of such resources. Thank you, Flavia. And, and Prof. Amit and Sarea, what, what's your view of the uh, uh, capacity in uh, India to uh, convert these new technologies, these environmental sound technologies, into reality? Uh, yeah, so uh, capacity, uh, I have already discussed that uh, what uh, kind of capacity uh, we do have uh, in India and uh, in, uh, in different uh, non uh, re sorry, renewable energy sources, uh, say for uh, uh, wind, uh, 60 gigawatt, for solar, 60 gigawatt, for biomass energies, 10 gigawatt, and rooftop solar is 40 gigawatt and the small hydro is 5 gigawatt. So out of 403 gigawatt we need for uh, total Indian population to cater this uh, 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 energy, uh, we are getting 279 from uh, almost renewable sources, which is 113 gigawatt from total uh, installed uh, renewable energy uh, uh, and 166 gigawatt uh, non-fossil fuel energy. So uh, we are act achieving actually 43% out of total energy requirement in uh, India uh, uh, through this uh, non-renewable, uh, sorry, renewable energy sources. Thank you, Prof. Amit. And Saraya, what, what do you think about the, the, the human capacity, the expertise, particularly amongst the communities that you're working in? Uh, do the people in the communities have the, the expertise to implement these technologies and also for operation and maintenance? Yeah, basically, uh, if we talk about the rural communities, if they are properly trained, if they are properly given the training, they have that possibility, they have that capacity to uh, to uh, you know run these uh, micro bees they have the capability to look after these uh, facilities because in manipur uh, the micro grids are running and they are only the not only the women not only the men but the women are also looking after the facilities they are uh, like uh, making a group and they are uh, like uh, doing all the activities among themselves so i think the rural communities can do these things uh, John, may I add uh, something to this with Shreya, that uh, uh, one interesting feature in India is that if you set up a uh, set up one microgrid and if you generate uh, 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 renewable energy sources, uh, electricity, uh, 
then you will uh, actually uh, getting some income uh, by uh, uh, replacing the fossil fuel uh, electricity source and so that income generation also is attached with this uh, kind of microgrid system that is very interesting and that is very lucrative for the rural communities so they are going for microgrids like monipur they are saving a lot of money and that money has been uh, used for making the self help groups and uh, the uh, products they are producing through uh, our renewable sources of energy that's that's a really important factor i was on a a, a panel yesterday in cop 27 where we were talking about these kinds of economic incentives and the importance of having the uh, private sector involved in developing uh, the technology such as microgrids uh, because the uh, the the big multilateral donors such as the the world bank or in africa the african development bank you know they have problems getting money out to small scale types of technological uh, developments such as microgrids so if you can get the private sector in there if you can get the communities directly involved and there are financial economic incentives to implement the technologies then it's going to going to happen and it'll kind of pretty much happen by itself but let's go over to um uh Suat and elizabeth in uh, indonesia uh what do you think about the uh the capacity in indonesia to uh both implement and absorb these 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 kinds of technologies earlier we uh we, we saw hafiz talking about the situation in zumba elizabeth you uh you disagreed with with hafiz there maybe you could start us off Okay, thank you, John. So, okay, but I'm not going to talk about what, uh, that statement. I would go for the capacity. Of course, the capacity is available and there in Indonesia, but definitely we need uh, support and also knowledge transfer for from uh, the more developed uh, country to be able to operate. And I think although the capacity is available and there the system is not so what we are needing right now is the policy and the system or the mechanism that makes sure that there will be people uh, the right people who operate and maintain and uh, government will set aside some budget to make sure that the operational will be sustainable I think I would stop here. Yeah, okay. So what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, well, I would I would say capacity is there. And, and I, would, I still echo Elizabeth's point that uh, lesson learned from other countries would be still, uh, would be needed. And I think because the, uh, the, the, the technology also is evolving and, uh, you know, uh, the cheaper, you know, more low cost would be also needed if, if there is. And, uh, you know, uh, technology transfer is also needed in that sense. Although uh, to implement technology is, uh, you know, uh, requiring, I would say, a lot of trainings and also uh, piloting. And in this case, I would encourage such uh, collaboration and tests to make sure that the idea can be adopted uh, at uh, you know uh, different places as well because in Indonesia we have uh, many more places, uh, especially uh, small islands, in need of uh, renewable energy and also a microgrid, as uh, we discuss uh, within this uh, session. So I would still uh, uh, encourage for uh, such collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And also we we have a question from one of the uh, live participants. Uh, which is which is actually directed at uh, 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 UPAX out, uh, and the uh, the questioner asks, can microgrid or another renewable energy be used a hundred to percent to replace fossil energy, or is it better to use a mix of energy from renewables and fossil energy? That's a really interesting question, and it's quite a contentious one. Uh, but perhaps you could give us some thoughts. Yeah, I. I think this is an important question. Uh, 
let me be honest that I'm not I'm not uh, an expert in microgrid, but I do I do work with uh, colleagues uh, here, especially and also uh, from my university on uh, on microgrid and also renewable energy. But I think the idea uh, ca can be can be applied if we have willingness, actually. Uh, but at the moment, the, 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 the problem is uh, related to cost, actually, related to cost. And the other thing is that when we talk about microgrid, of course, we try to, to sustain that in that sense that to mix the different types of renewable energy will help also for the sustainability because there are some limit, limitations, but to mix that will also provide positive sides from each of the renewable energy sources that we have. Uh, I will I will let this also others uh, from here, from this session, who would comment on this uh, question, particularly on microgrid. Thank you, John. Yeah, perhaps we can we can also go to Mary Susan there because Creek has a, uh, a, a lot of very active experience with uh, training technicians uh, and um, trying to disseminate other kinds of uh, technologies to encourage people to to shift to clean green energy that you've done your, some fantastic work on electric cookers um, uh, but, but to come back to this the, this question Mary Susan that um, was uh, asked earlier by the panel can a microgrid be used in a city uh, because of blackouts in the city uh, that can be worse than in rural areas uh, is it possible for uh cities to have other alternative uh sources of of power from things like microgrids in uganda i know you've been uh involved in rolling out um uh solar pv a lot training a lot of technicians what what's your experience about the use of these kinds of renewable energy technologies within urban environments Thank you so much, uh, Professor John. Um, in Uganda, it makes a lot of sense to have a mix uh, of the renewable energy resources because Uganda is actually very well endowed with these resources and we haven't utilized uh, a lot of it. Solar PV, uh, we have geothermal that the government is investing in. We have other sources from bioenergy We've also spotted a few uh, resources in northern Uganda and around Lake Victoria for wind energy. And at Creek, we have technicians that have been trained, but we've also been training uh, other technicians in the regions of the country. And uh, if we look at our national development plan, uh, there is a, a, a strong uh, aspect on using renewable energy to increase that mix. There are even uh, groups that are advocating for 100% use of renewable energy to increase access to energy all over the country. And right now, our numbers indicate that uh, about 60% of our uh, electricity access in the country is coming from uh, mini grids and, and micro grids. So that potential is high and uh, we'll continue to uh, run a lot of projects, build capacity, and work with partners to advance this at Creek. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I mean, my own personal opinion is that uh, microgrids and renewable energy technologies, uh, they're often criticized that the energy can only come when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing, for example. Uh, uh, and it's a question of having the right energy generation mix and transitioning over in a fair, equitable and just way to reduce dependence on, on fossil fuels and uh, increase the use of environmentally sound technologies. Well, let's, let's have a look at an example of the, the application of the, the microgrid design software uh, in Uganda with uh, uh, the Watoto village where, where Creek and Agnes have been working. So Jono, could you show us the, uh, the clip where we'll see Laura introducing the Watoto case study? Uganda has 70% of the homes without access to electricity. 
This is similar to a case study of Watoto, a children's village that's 32 kilometers away from the city center. With this village, you find their homes and their children, but they have no access to electricity. And you know the challenges of having no access to electricity. That means their, their reading hours have been cut short, and they are also exposed to using unsafe forms of energy. So what we are working on right now is a software to help us develop sustainable and resilient mini-grids using hybrid energy solutions. So we are using Python to optimize these energy sources and what we have developed at the end, our objective is to provide a least cost solution for energy. So we have so far implemented this case study with Watoto Homes and we were combining solar and wind energy resources. And what we have found is a cheaper solution to connect these mini grids. Uh, and we hope to see this also across the country. Thank you very much, Jono. Uh, Mary, Susan and Flavia, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the, the Watoto case study uh, and other efforts that uh, you've been making to uh, introduce electrical energy technologies into, into the home. I mentioned the electric cookers earlier. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about that, because it's not just about designing a microgrid it's all the other things that come with that, the social changes, the, uh, the people absorbing these, these kinds of technologies and the technologies being appropriate to, to people's needs. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that case study uh, and your amazing work on cooking, that would be great. Thank you, Professor John. So um, the project uh, that uh, we've just watched, that is Watoto Village, uh, is one of the many sites that uh, Creek has considered uh, throughout the years working with partners to uh, demonstrate uh, the application of the tool we've been speaking about now, uh, or PIE plan, uh, on, on, on designing and optimizing uh, dissemination of electrical uh, systems within a microgrid setting, sometimes it's called isolated grids or decentralized uh, energy systems, to see that uh, these uh, far areas from the grid where the national plan on electrification may take a while, uh, also have access to electricity in an affordable way, in a way that uh, operational costs are managed and um, uh, locals are trained to run such a system. So the village that you've just watched, Watoto Village, is a good uh, example of a structured community uh, with uh, over hundreds of families uh, that can be connected to a microgrid. In this case, uh, solar and wind combined. And we've done that study, check that there's a lot of uh, productive users that can benefit from a microgrid they had generators using fossil fuels before. Now that that is shifted to renewable energy for them to do their productive uses. Every family has about uh, nine uh, people in the house with children, mothers, and uh, also uh, with the microgrid, we have an opportunity to connect one of our, our clean cooking flagships uh, that uh, Professor John was talking about, the e-cooking that uses very little power and is able to, to, to replace uh, some of the unclean technologies that they were using for cooking that were detrimental to the children and, and the environment. So this is a very nice study, uh, the, the management of the villages uh, because they have several sites in the country, are very committed to working with us to invest and multiply these microgrids uh, in their sites all over the country. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, Flavia, I, clean cooking is, is a really important issue and uh, a lot of shifting, making that transition from uh, biomass combustion and the uh, creation of smoke, the so-called killer in the kitchen, to to the work you've been doing e-cooking. It's it's about hearts and minds. Can you tell us a, a bit of about the work that you've been doing to try and encourage people to to shift to cleaner technologies? Thank you for that question. So. 
there has been, uh, I think for the very longest time, people have a big bias with using electricity for cooking. And everyone feels like electricity is very expensive. But in 2022, at the start of the year, the government also reduced on the tariffs for electricity. So the cost per kilowatt really went down. And we have also been able to test out different uh, technologies, like the electric pressure cookers, just to see and demonstrate to people if you use the electric pressure cooker in comparison to other cooking technologies, how much money are you able to save? Because people believe in seeing things and experiencing them. So we carried out a study with over uh, 20 households and we just really put meters in there and tried to monitor their cooking habits. And the good thing about these electric pressure cookers, they not only cook um, you know, very fast meals, but we also have the Ugandan staples. We have a staple food called matoke, which is dear to the hearts of people here in Uganda. And if an improved uh, technology cannot do that, then people are not willing to transition. So just being able to demonstrate to them the meals that they care about, uh, the same can make people have been able to shift. And now we are seeing people adopting the electric pressure cookers or even e cooking in general. Uh, earlier on this year, we also published the e cookbook, and it's basically a guide that just takes you through how you can cook different meals and how you can be able to save time and money using uh, the electric pressure cookers or e-cooking technology. So we shall be able to see a lot of mindsets being shifted from uh, the traditional forms of energy or even just other formats like LPG and probably more people taking up e-cooking in Uganda. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Flavia. And, and January, we'll all be getting together again with the team. So uh, I hope we'll have an opportunity to eat some matoke that's cooked with the, the e-cookers. Uh, Jono, can you show us the, uh, the next video clip um, with Agnes showing the optimal network configuration that she developed uh, using Pai Plan for Watoto Village? So in this case, we have the Watoto system layout where we can see the layout of the village given the load survey that was done. And this can also be viewed on a map. The feeder routing, since it uses GIS locations, can easily map your network onto Google Map as is shown here. So this is Watoto village and these are the different uh, um, load points that are available and this was the optimal network configuration that was designed. Thank you very much, John. There it is, uh, the uh, microgrid design tool in action. And of course, we previously we saw the, the, the video of Watoto Village itself. So we can see there how the design tool and the actual village uh, relate. Um, so let's go back to a general discussion here. I mean, do we think that microgrids have a future in India, Indonesia and Uganda? And uh, will they help to achieve sustainable development goals and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change objectives of technology transfer of enabling development without increasing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, we've got some questions that are coming in from the, uh, the participants. So. Raphael asks, uh, if this smart grid has been successful for producing electricity, can microgrid energy be converted into energy other than electricity uh, in development? Uh, that's an interesting question. And perhaps it's a matter of uh, what we say in English, horses for courses, that you have a mix of different types of generating capacity. But perhaps I can pass that one over to Prof. Amit and Saraya for, for their opinion. Uh, this technology transfer or shifting from uh, non-renewable energy to renewable energy in India is very fast. Uh, we are actually achieving a fifth position in solar power in the world and fourth position in wind power. So, Actually, uh, we are also uh, the first green hydrogen microgrid project has been awarded to National Thermal Power Corporation Limited recently at Andhra Pradesh. So very quickly, uh, we are shifting from that fossil fuel energy sources to 
renewable one. Uh, interestingly, the government policies are like that, that when they are uh, giving, uh, sanctioning the big projects uh, to universities, to academics, and also for non-government organizations, they are, uh, those projects are uh, on, on renewable energy sources, uh, obviously. And uh, another interesting thing is that we have a millions of non microgrid uh, sources of energy in different rural areas. Say, when we, we have established the biogas in, in, in our local village through this Bay Farm project, where John is one of the participants. And uh, uh, we, we are giving uh, cooking uh, fuel as well as uh, that, that is green and as well as electricity to the household. So this kind of direct uh, generation is uh, going on in millions of houses in different villages. Now, there's a question that uh, this, uh, this is a very interesting question, that if we can make this policy to, uh, so, uh, to uh, for, for, for microgrid uh, setup, uh, we can give this kind of millions of energies from renewable sources through microgrid to the households and for the, in the entire village or the entire community. That will be fantastic, I think. Uh, uh, that will give us a lot of opportunities to save our money and, uh, and generation of income also and, and to fulfill the policies uh, of the government, I think. That's... Thank you very much. Rev, would you like to uh, add anything to that? So in this, um, I would just like to add a little bit that we had one of our project that was Indo UK Bird project, where we generated electricity through bio waste, um, bio energy from uh, kitchen waste and household waste from the nearby tribal villages. And through solar panel, we generated electricity in that project, and we provided electricity to those tribal houses. So that uh, enabled them to uh, like uh, to have a proper life after the dark also because earlier they used to go uh, go uh, like used to go to bed uh, just after the dark and the children they never used to study after the dark so now they are having that life after dark and the children they are getting more time to study and the education has also increased so that is a good achievement of Vishwa Bharati that we can see now the local self government has decided to uh, uh, establish uh, microgrid and use this kind of uh, electricity generation uh, to the uh, community because it's a very small village, a small community, and as well as cooking uh, fuel uh, that is green uh, to the to all households instead of that LPG. Thank you very much indeed. I, I think we've just got time for one last question, and I think I'll go to uh, Anissa, and I'm going to pitch it at a, at a high level. Um, equitable, sustainable development. Do you, Anissa, do you think it's it's possible to to maximise utilisation of energy sources to cover all regions as a form of equitable, sustainable development? What are, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Lovett. So I'll try to answer that question. But uh, I think I think uh, based on the case also in Uganda and India, I think the keywords is like a community-based renewable energy uh, system. So so I think it will, which is work for local people as well, not only like a big corporation. I think that's the keyword, the community-based uh, renewable energy project, including the microgrid. And I think uh, it's not only about the technology, but it also need the energy system. So uh, people, local people need to be uh, trained and etc. So I think uh, that will uh, result in equitable, sustainable development and policy and regulatory change might be required. And their need uh, ministry and stakeholder collaboration should be highly involved in the process of, for example, selecting, designing, and implementing this, uh, for example, microgrid models. But I think that's the keyword, yeah, the community-based renewable energy projects. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you, Anisha. Yeah, and I, I, I think governance is an important thing. They're having the right institutional framework to, to empower the communities. I think we've come to the, the, the end of our time now. Uh, so I, I would like to thank all of the participants are on the panel.
for for your time and your uh, very good uh, participation with the with the comments uh, and also all the people uh, the participants in the YouTube live event. Uh, thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. And if you're interested in microgrids, then please go to uh, the FutureLearn platform and uh, have a look at our two-week course on microgrids where you can find out more about the different aspects of microgrids, including the, the socioeconomics as, as well as how PIE plan works. So thank you very much. Jono, can I hand over to you for the final clip? Microgrids could be the key to sustainable energy access globally because they are flexible, efficient, reliable and incorporate renewable energy sources. In this course, you will explore microgrids, learn about the different approaches to electrification globally, consider off-grid innovations and look into how this technology could be utilised to develop sustainable energy solutions in a wide range of communities. You'll look at the planning and technical design of microgrids and explore the socioeconomic impact of their adoption through case studies from around the world. You'll also learn about different modeling tools and how a range of design approaches work in practice. You'll then apply the knowledge you've acquired by completing a feasibility study for selecting and designing your own microgrid. If you want to understand microgrids and develop skills that you can readily use, join this course today.